Can I I'll start with some history. Um, a lot of technologies have roots in the defense. Uh, when you use your cell phone, remember the roots for cell phone in World War II. The first mobile phones was used in World War II. Um, most of the uh, civilian technology have roots in the tactical world. So history, actually, tactical radios have been in use for over 100 years. Um, in the, uh, you know, like 1905, there were tactical radios. But they were carried by four mules and two wagons. And that was the specs. So four cars, they were carried by mules and wagons. And uh, hardware was based on micrometers, part gaps. And technology was evolving, the magnetic and electronic a crystal detector, then vacuum tube came. That was a big move. Uh, and vacuum tube meant, meant the radio you can fit in a car. Like you could around. But I want you to understand that the tactical radios have been used even before cars. And it was when, you know, a command post set to send the tactical radio. And they have to be able to keep the cave um, to the headquarters. So, um, Right after, like the uh, Mexican War, when tactical radios became reality, so it's very old. Now the Vietnam era, the Vietnam War was long, and it was a benchmark. If you remember, we, you know, when I was a kid, we used to have a VHF radio and all that stuff. The Vietnam era had a power um, thing for it. Um, you had armor, infantry, and artillery, and you used VHF. High frequency were used for long distance over the horizon. UHF used for air to air, air to ground. The problem is the Soviet Union was able to jam these sites. So we came out of the Vietnam era where the different months. So that's the history I want to start from after Vietnam. So after Vietnam, you can look at tactical radios at three generations. One is conventional radios, one is software radios, software defined radios, and the new one is cognitive radios. We in academia like to go on research about cognitive radios. But we need to look at it this way. These conventional radios, I mean by them, spread spectrum radios that can have jamming resistance. So we came out of Vietnam, actually, here in Vietnam, there was an initiative to develop these new generation radios. Um, their traditional RF uh, baseband design, they support a fixed number of users. They're not configurable after the point. And we'll have an example of the best radio in the generation. Um, specific uses defined at the time of the design. And you cannot upgrade it. Right? So that's a new this is a generation of radios. This initiative for it is started maybe late 60s, you start thinking about it. Developed in the 70s, they were in deployment in the 80s. So, if you, if, if you see I'm saying F16 today, it will be deployed with a Link 16 model, or the Link 16 radio, that technology is this era. We'll have a detailed example of it. Now, we have another generation, it's called software radios, or software defined radios. They can support a variable number of users. You can change the protocol and then you download a new software, it's a new radio, right? They're highly configurable, they have a lot of uh, QS capabilities, software upgradable. Then there is a third generation now, which is our future. These radios are starting to be deployed. Um, the new generation is cognitive radios. They can create new waveform in its own. I, I hope you guys know about cognitive radios. You can negotiate new interfaces. Um, you can morph and adjust itself as the application needs and the environment around them. They can do collaborative and software upgrades and so on. We'll talk, we'll talk about cognitive radius as well. But these are the three generations that we should look at it from a scientific perspective. You know? So if we follow that model, Link 16, it's a conventional radio, it's the best of its generation, and I'll tell you why. Um, there are three famous radios from this generation, Link 16 and uh, uh, Aplars and Singars. 
we've talked about why Linux 16 is the best out of it. Then the JTRS program, I don't know if you guys heard about it, Joint Tactical Radio System. It is the biggest government initiative to develop tactical radios. Multi-billion dollar. It has multiple waveforms. The WNW, which stands for Wide Area Network Waveform, is the most complex software-defined radio or software programmable radio. It's the most complex initiative ever taken. We talk about WNW as well. Now, cognitive radios are still evolving. You know, there is different um, ideas of it. The Darby XG is one of them. But if one thinks of software programmable radios as conventional radios, added software architecture, <coughs> reconfiguration ability, uh, ease upgrade, then you will need to think of cognitive radios as a software programmable radios, but they have intelligence, awareness, learning, and observation. I think that would be a good definition. So, the 16 waveform was conceived before the standardization of the protocol the stack player. It's not an IP base. Win 16 is not IP. It was conceived before we had networking happen and we all decided to move to the IP protocol stack. The core functionalities are in the physical and data link player. What's equivalent to the MAC player, where you have a portion, you divide the physical resources, uh, is done at the planning phase, so it's static. Um, basically, if you look at it, time domain and frequency domain, and you have these slots, they are assigned static, in a static way uh, at the, before deployment. The so they're assigned a set of time blocks. And instead of MAC frames and IP packets, uh, a block of 75 bit, they call it J words, is used for transmitting and receiving data over the Link 16 now. So this is an old technology. If we go to the details of it, so the vertical axe is FDMA, frequency dependent multiplexes. So we, we divide the frequency this way. This is the time to me, divided that way. So you look at it stacked like that. You can say if I take a strip out of that, it becomes a net. But that's to make you understand what a net is. In actuality, there is a lot of belief between the nets that form a net. Um, so here is a TV main Link 16. The time slot, they're divided to 32,767 time slots, and the numbers take like 1A, 1B, 1C, 1A, 1B. That's how it's designed. I don't know if the details um, matter. But technically, you can have a Navy uh, aircraft carrier with Navy airplanes flying using a Link 16 map. And the Air Force can have, you see that picture of a wax, And these could be um, an Air Force squad. You can be using another map. Um, So where is this fact that we use wide spectrum in the UHF LX band between 960 and 1215 megahertz? Um, it has 51 frequencies. Um, TV may use 12.8 minutes, 768 seconds. We call them EPA. EPA is the whole range. Um, we have three sets of time slots. Each time slot is 7.8125 milliseconds. <laughs> And it consisted of a train of pulse of 6.4 6 microsecond. Uh, and you have a separated interval. You know, there is a lot of idle gaps in that design uh, of 6.6 .6 microsecond. So it has 508 hopping pattern. And it also uses CDMA with that. It was a very excellent jam resistance uh, rate because of the hopping, it used you know, um, very complex hopping patterns. It uses um, CDMA. We'll go into some more details of that. How is how is the hopping? So your net is not really here. Your net can be here, 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 here. And your hopping pattern is programmed to you before deployment. 
and a planning software to size each snap copy pattern so don't be, you only know it. So, so we all stay in the same consistent viewpoint on a slot. When slot starts, it stops. But I will change my frequency and time of transmission according to the schedule. Yes, yes. And we, we mean we are in the same map. Because the Navy can have a nap and the Air Force can have a nap. They do not provide. There is a big planner that plans length 16 to form in base and whatever the plan will happen. And the planner, planner decides how many nap will be in it. And the planning software decides how the, uh, the slots are assigned and how you hop it. Maybe. And it actually uses fast hopping. You know, all tactical radius use fast hop, not slow hop. So actually, they hop within the transmission symmetry. Uh, they hop within that. Yes. It's a very, very long time. Um, a lot of the design of that, don't ask why, because some of the some of the features of it would enhance it later. Um, like uh, the orthogonal um, check codes, they were in orthogonal of the original design. The check code became orthogonal in later code of the waveform. So we can look at it and say, you know, we are engineers, we know that the check codes have to be orthogonal, right? We know that from the commercial wire. But people, they were afraid if we go to orthogonal, and you know, uh, the enemy can figure out how we do our chip, how we do our chip code. So they intentionally made it less efficient. <laughs> then later on, we reached orthogonality without jeopardizing, um, you know, knowing what, the, you know, your figure patterns can be a large number. So a lot of this stuff, don't ask why this is how it was done. Uh, but in, in its generation, Link 16 was a breakthrough, and I'll come to that now. So does fast half hopping occur within the same time slots every 15 microseconds during every pulse? So 600 times per slot. And, and that's what makes it very good jamming resistance, because the yeah, Soviet Union jammers, what we learned from men, uh, you can zero in, in a frequency and increase the uh, spectrum on it and jam it. Now, when the CDMA and these channel resistant radio came, basically jammers have to jam the whole spectrum. So the, the, their spectrum is weak because they're jamming a wide range. So now CDMA can still work. Um, actually, you know, uh, a length 16 flying from the U.S., the U.S. Department of Defense will have, I mean, uh, an F-16, the robot plane, flying will have a length 16 on it. But if um, a friendly country buys an F-16, it does not have length 16 in it. It has a predecessor to it called Link 11, which is a weaker waveform, very weak. Um, and that's how we do it here in the U.S. We, we have to be downgrade our technology a little before we get into France. Uh, so, Link 16 was America, was the first application of concatenated codes outside of the space code, right? Um, and you guys, when you take the air control coding course, you hear the story about uh, Voyager, that the encoder went in the spaceship before we built the decoder on Earth. And it was the first application of concatenated codes. Actually, this was the first application of concatenated codes outside of the space program. You will laugh at it now, given what you know about our control coding today. But instead of this design, was put in the 1960s. That was awesome. So it used all this code with simple interleaving. Five bits per simple. So you know the Volai field to the power five. It used rate 16.7 and 31.15. Um, used error detection on top of that. The people 12 parity bits are used within each three words, or a block of 225 bits. 
So it had read Solomon code and had error detection on top of it. The parity bits are generated using that code 237225 polynomial code. You can find the design for that easy for control coding books. Encryption is very important for technical radios. Two types of encryption. They call it transmission security, TSAC, and message security. This concept is still in today when you go on IP based network. There is TransAC and there is a concept. So the TransAC is the same as here at the RF, you know, you want to encrypt your RF signal. But on top of that, there's a message that's encrypted as well. In today's IP based networks, you have the TransAC and you have the concept, and the concept encrypts the IP packet. So the concept that this team brought to us was still carried today. You have, you have this multi-level uh, security. Um, the uh, term of defense flight to use the term defense in depth. So you have multi-level security. One gets jeopardized, the other is still there. So an, an enemy attempting to listen um, to or receive blimps seen signal has to zero in on the hopping pattern, has to be able to decipher the M stack, the trend stack, it is challenging. And I can tell you, up to the, up till today, Link 16 is not jammed right. Or well, every enemy who tries to jam it, jam it from the force. Go in the spectrum and jam it. We could not track the hopping pattern in any of that. So this is what we know, right? We like these graphs a lot as ECE. Um, so you have the 3115RS encoder, simple <coughs> for leaving. Here is the CCSK MRA modulator, because we use chip code. Sequence scrambler, we use scrambling as well, frequency hopping. You can see now how this design is all static. It's all security levels. So later enhancement of Link 16 uses RS code with erasure. That was actually a good enhancement. First R application of Reed Solomon code here didn't do it with erasure. So the fake was part encoded is the only one, right? After that, uh, the erasure was applied to it, which enhanced it, and the CCSK became orthogonal. So these, like, the, uh, I'm trying to explain Link 16 and what we, we know as electrical engineers, right? Now, I want to come to a concept called the tactical internet. The same generation of Link 16 with the E-plus radio and the Centaur's radio. These have the same concept, not, not as complex as Link 16, but you have the PDMA and FDMA. It's the same generation of radio. Um, but in the 1990s, IP became dominant. So the U.S. Army formed what we call the tactical internet, um, in which tactical circuit switching networks were digitized. You had the circuit switching networks between command forces and headquarters. They had this set up of circuit switch. And what they did, they created, they called it digitized, which put IP in public. Um, and they created what we call it IP touch points. So all these, what we call it legacy reform, things, thing, uh, it bar, same bar, had an IP gateway. So actually, if you look at the IP gateway of the it bar's radio, when it looks at an IP router, it has every member of the tactical subnet have an IP address. Maps its physical layer address to an IP address. So the outside world can see this if large subnet as if it is an IP based sub. And the wisdom for that, for the government to think that way, we cannot come and say, I'm taking all this old system and throwing it out and putting a new IP based system. It will never work. So when the government comes and say, okay, we're going to create IP touch points. So all these legacy waveforms will have an IP gate one. Then we go on to come to the surface switch backbone network and digitize it so it became IP at the core. Now, we can take a legacy softening and replace it with an IP based softening, and the rest of the theater is still the same. Um, this is how we think the technical work. So, we 
IP touch points were created. So the uh, US Army created what we call it the tactical internet. Legacy waveforms with IP touch points and digitized backbone. All IP services interfaces to the commercial internet was possible. So if you go in the second block, 2004, right? Um, a lot of IP applications, the soldier in the air can pull a laptop out, connect it to an ETLARS radio through some IP interface to it. The ETLARS radio essentially have an IP address in a bigger context of the tactical interface. But that soldier can even download information from the Pentagon because the core network has satellite links to the Pentagon, so everything is connected. So IP services were possible. If you were watching the news in the second Gulf War, and they tell you how the US Army moved from Kuwait to Baghdad very quick, very fast, with even sand storms, the US Army used the technology then called FPCP2, or also known as Red Force Black Force tracking, in which each radio have a GPS location. So each radio transmits the GPS location to servers, and servers collect the GPS location. So I know all my friendly forces, their location. Any reconnaissance that spots an enemy place enter the GPS location of that enemy, or any enemy RF signal that would take the the location of the RF signal were entered. So the server may not have information about friendly forces and enemy forces. These US soldiers driving these tanks had a screen in front of them and they had red dots and black dots, and blue dots. So they knew where their enemies were, they knew where their friends were. So that was making convoys move fast. Um, no friendly fires. One of the biggest problems in war was friendly fighters. You kill your friend, you know, your enemy, because you bomb life. Now a lot of these bombs will not fall if it knows there is a friendly, a blue dot in that place. Um, and also the convoys can move fast. So moving to an IP-based infrastructure with essential which is IP services. An IP service means we can do client servers and do all that stuff. Any questions here? So we're moving to the next generation, IP-based MA waveforms. So the government have a concept called GIG, Global Information Grid, to replace tactical information. <coughs> the Global Information Grid means everyone is connected. Like the ability you have today, I pull, your, I pull my iPhone out and I can surf the internet. Right. A parallel to that, the, the soldier can hold his device anywhere in the world and have connectivity anywhere in the world. Um, the global information grid is really a big dream, but it means we have to replace legacy waveforms with IP-based MNA waveforms, right? And then the backbone and theater that used to be IP over circuit switch would be IP-based wide area network. White, white area waveforms, and um, we have satellite connectivity. We have, if you can reach a fiber cable in the ground and lease it, you can make your forces around the world. Everybody's connected. It's the parallel of the internet, but with the defense. So, the WNW was the most comprehensive undertaking by the GTRS program for it anyway. Um, I don't know if you heard about the WNW waveform, but <laughs> here is what we call it the tactical gig. The gig has had two parts. One is strategic part, which is all these uh, fiber optical cables and the satellite links. It's the big, big infrastructure. But in the war theater, it has what we call it the tactical gig. But if you go from the bottom here, we call it SRW stands for a soldier radio waveform, and it was done by the JTRS program as well. And it has two tiers, tier 1A and 1B. So the tier 1A has sensors, 
key idea of the gate also is you can fight war without soldiers. So you can send robots, you can send drones, you can already use drones too. Um, and you, you can have human existence at least possible. So there is a sensors level of the SRW, then there is a soldier level. And um, it's, if you look at it, and, I, I, and that's one of the things I want to bring it in, in this seminar. Uh, above the SRW, there is the WMW Global Summit, the WMW Global Summit, then replacing the infrastructure that used to be circuit switched with waveforms like HNW, high band network waveform, NCW, network centric waveform. This one is satellite based. The satellite transponder gets in the world theater, you form an A subnet on the whole with the satellite base. But what I want you to get from this figure is I go to this conference and I see graduate students presenting all these great ideas about Manet. But they look at Manet as a flat. It is one Manet in the whole world theater. That's not true. Because you cannot have Josh Moore talking to the general freely. The military have hierarchy. And the military have security requirements. So when Manet is applied to the tactical world, it's applied as an island of Manet. So how does this island talk to this island? You have to have one radio here as a gateway that have two channels. So you have to specify gateways to link one Mene island to another Mene island. It is not the Mene you read books where everyone can talk to everyone freely. The application is not that way. So what you have in the world war theater is islands of Mene's with gateway nodes that have multi frequency. But for this radio to come to this subnet, it cannot work. Actually, practically, you have to shut it down. You have to download into it a new encryption key because each one of the subnets have its own encryption key. So you put the new encryption key and then you boot it up, and then it can become part of the subnet. It's one of the problems I see in conferences a lot. You know, uh, the theoretical world is ideal, the practical world is not ideal. If he says not my name, I call it islands of my name. So here is the protocol stack of the WNW waveform. What we love it, we are electrical engineers, we have the signal in space, we call it sys layer. <laughs> so this is where the RF happens. There is a mobile data link layer, MDL, mobile internet layer, in my layer. Then we call it here cipher text. Sometimes you hear the name flat, IP layer. Then here, here is the encryption device or the encryption standards for IP. Stands for high assurance internet protocol encryption. That screws up everything you understand about networking, basically. And then you have the plain text for the red IP layer. That protocol stack is strange because you form an IP based subnet from the cipher text layer. PP standards saying this layer and this layer cannot communicate. They're actually separated physically and everything. You cannot communicate. And if that HAPE encryption key, if you don't have the same encryption key and you receive a packet, it will go up here and dock. So this plain taxing place or any place, they're isolated. There is a lot of good reasons for that. I don't know if you guys hear about NSA. National Security Agent. You put the Haiti standards and you don't mess with these guys. Um, they have the tomb where a lot of research is buried. 
because you do this great research and you can develop this great technology and you don't adhere to FSA standards and basically your research work is uh, I can spend days explaining how AP works. I'm one of the few people who understand its problems very well. It is problematic. It makes it makes you not understand what's going on. Because this is an application for IP4. You can plug any application for it. Standard IP. Now there is an IP port here, and we, we call it the gig I port, IP port, which you can connect to the gig. But you're connected to the gig in the cipher text. So you only can communicate some to someone in the gig that has your encryption key. If he doesn't have it, he's useless. It makes it very complex. But the beauty of this waveform, it had a lot of breakthrough technologies. We all know what OSPF is, right? Open short test first. Down this way, it runs a protocol called Radio OSPF. And basically, if you run an OSPF on MNA network, all your link state updates will be your bandwidth. So our OSPF is a mutation of OSPF where the link state gets learned from the lower layers, not discovered by the IP layer. So you don't have to send it, you don't have to clutter the limited bandwidth. There is a lot of breakthroughs that the WNW waveform did. It's basically the first practical use of MNA in the technical environment. And, you know, we, we uh, if we compare tactical radius to commercial wires today, it's an unfair comparison. Because you have a fixed infrastructure here, you have a base station. In the tactical world, there's nothing fixed, everybody's local. And the only way that gets you out of your submit is if you have a, if you are a two frequency radio, then you can get up to another frequency in a higher hierarchy. There is a lot of breakthroughs that was done with the WNW waveform. Um, it used cross-layer signal. It used it and it used it very well. So there is a lot going on here. But this is, for example, there's some something called link adaptation that goes from the uh, RF layer to the M MDL. Um, the throughput is decided by the upper layer. The service rate here and the service rate is to each individual receiver and the subnet. Transmission failure is reported. Demand decides how you do the scheduling. It's very complex. Um, I can go on about it, but I have a few points here. The MDL forms the MI of the service rate. I, I can go through this, but it's a lot of cross layer signaling that these layers don't work in vacuum. There are actually a lot of reporting between the layers, so you can optimize using the resources dynamically. Um, to create an um, a radio that can be deployed with this capability is, is a big challenge. Um, and here's another thing we have, the link adaptation. It's not simply increase rate or decrease rate, or increase power or decrease power. We can have the same radio. And the deployment puts it in different environments. For example, if you have a radio mounted to a vehicle that is feeding power from the vehicle that better, you have enough power. But if you have a radio and an unmanned sensor thrown out there, power is precious. So actually this waveform can choose the number of hops to minimize the maximize throughput or to minimize power consumption. So what you see that when I put this state number transition parameters, all of that, these are like tables that can be fed to the radio. So one table will make the radio optimized for throughput. One table will make the radio optimized for number of offset speed. One table can make the radio optimized for power consumption. It is a, a different configuration. And you see the roots of cognitive radius here, right? Cognitive radius have to morph to meet requirements. Here in this generation, we put this configuration tables in to meet the front wire. So again, a lot of the link adaptation parameters adjust the syslayer transmission mode. I don't want to go into the details. Um, like, you know, you guys have the slides probably. 
I don't know if you heard about USAP protocol. Universal Slot Allocation Protocol it is very big in the So this is how Rockwell Collins implemented USAP in the WMW agent. Um, I got this information from Rockwell Collins, actually. So they have three kinds of slots. One is called bootstrap slots. One is called fixed reservation slots. One is called retaining broadcast slots. And it explains here how each of them, you know, the bootstrap slots are for um, basically network management. To run the waveform without, you know, collision that when you use a slot, nobody else will use the same slot as collision. We have to avoid collision. It's a big problem. And also to adapt to the throughput and to inform your neighbors of your demand and all of that. The network traffic is big. So the bootstrap slots are dedicated for that. Fixed reservation slots, that's for unicast traffic. Retaining reservation slots is for unicast or multicast and broadcast traffic. And there's a lot of details about them. I don't want to go in the details, actually. I have a chapter in the book that details them. So the help reuse, I don't know if you guys don't want to research in the cognitive radius and you know the hidden terminal problem is famous in cognitive radius, right? So the designers of the W have a similar problem. So you have to reuse the same frequency in three hops away. So if you're using it here, you can a neighbor cannot use it, three cannot use it, four cannot use it, but here one can use it again. Um, you know, it is not the uh, it is not the uh, the hidden terminal problem, but the similar concept to prevent collision. They have to reuse, hop reuse. Um, have to make sure that you don't have collision. So ROSPF is one of the good um, implementation that the WNW has. It. Link stop still updates are not discovered by the cipher text IP layer. Um, you can increase the number of nodes in a single subnet. If you've seen research, especially came from BBN, I don't know if you guys will be here. Um, like, you know him well? Yeah, yeah. So I'm well. Well, well, well. They'll probably give you a hard time. If you look at their publications from 10, 12 years ago, they will show, the they are the developed the ROSPF. They will show if you use OSPF, and the number of nodes reach 25, 30, and the exponential increase of the state of the you know, and how the bandwidth is eating. And they show you the curve with auto SPF that it goes later, the current case later. They made a lot of propaganda about that. So they didn't use the hello protocol for link discovery, link state updates. Instead, auto SPF adjacencies are provided by simulated hello packets containing link state information simulated because it comes from information comes from the lower layer. Uh, the MI layer implements ROSPF, which forms a topology backbone. There's more details in that. I mean, if you need more details in that specific area, let me know. I can tell you which Milcom papers to look at or give you more information. I want you to understand that tactical many and hate encryption. Hate is a problem. Encryption keys are loaded into the radio according to military hierarchy. They're not going to talk to me unless you have my encryption key. That's the key. No roaming. The radio has to be turned off. A new encryption key loaded with a powered backup. It can join only one specific subnet of subnets if you have multiple frequencies. This gives one of the best advantages of MNA. So tactical MNA is not as good as just simple MNA. Now, this is the third generation. Any questions about WW before we move on? The same generation have the SRW radio, social radio waveform, have the HNW and NCW. All of these ranges have a lot of beautiful uh, capabilities if you want to know about it. So, new generation called cognitive radios. And I put this figure because we always had this war of the PCE versus computer science field. So in PCE, we, we know that the RF player is very complex, and anything that bothers is just not 
important. <laughs> there are science guys. <laughs> go on and say everything above the IP layer is just magic. Right? So this concept was taken to cognitive rage. We look at it as we have an operating environment, we have a Mac layer that have a cognitive engine in it, and we have the radio physical layer, so the important component, right? The guys who do the cognitive engine, the computer science guy, say, no, 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 it is a cognitive engine, and we have a radio transmission, radio receiver, radio matrix, that everything feeds the cognitive engine. The cognitive engine is the core of the radio, right? Um, I think the slide I took it from some Virginia Tech uh -huh. paper. This definition. So the cognitive engine have a lot of components in it. They have the cognitive engine user interface where you feed the policies, security, user interface, and you have all these models. Um, there is a cognitive engine controller. Uh, you have a source monitor, evolver, decision makers, WSGA. I mean, there's some details, knowledge base, some details about the cognitive engine. I think one of the best resources in how cognitive engine are, you can find it in the beginning of fact about computations. Um, <coughs> I like this slide a lot. Because for us, an electrical engineer, and we think this is not going to do anything. We have an understanding that, um, you know, you can morph error correction capability. We have done that. Adaptive error control coding, we know, right? Um, frequency bands, we know how to hop between frequencies and change it. We know how to change modulation techniques, string code, payload, signal power. So we know how to do this stuff adaptively, right? But the cognitive engine guys say, oh, there's a biological metaphor. And this is like uh, the genes of the radio, chromosomes, represent the traits of the radio. And the traits are error correction, frequency, the stuff we know. Uh, so the WSGA analyzed the information fit to it from the cognitive system module in order to make the radio adapt, morph, to the change in the environment, changing the radio parameters, genes, as equivalent to the creation of a new radio chromosome. For us, we know that, yeah, that, and instead of putting a configuration table into a software programmable radio, we had an engine that analyzed the environment and created its own configuration table, right? That's how we see it. We see it as, you know, genetic meditation. So DARPA generated its own cognitive radio it's called the XG initiative. Um, Harvard in that program focused in controlling the radio using rules, policy-based, network management, and human. very, very strong rules. Um, that cognitive radio, the idea is to deploy it anywhere in the world with only uh, a change in policy rules. This radio can sense the spectrum, use the policies to decide which channel to use. A collection of centralized and distributed protocols are used for spectrum awareness spectrum allocation and spectrum reuse. If you go today and ask anyone who works in cognitive radio practically, what area of cognitive rate is have value, you're going to tell you it's only spectrum sensitive. Unfortunately, all the other areas didn't have much value, although we'll start seeing some application. But the, and, and, uh, the FCC defines cognitive rate to make the other definition. And their definition is that the radius can use spectrum freely and can sense their environment and choose which. <coughs> their definition has no mention of a cognitive engine. Their definition of cognitive radius is spectrum reuse. 
it is yeah, the biggest area in Canada. So, but there is more stuff popping lately. I don't know how much of it will come to the technical field. So if we want to think not cognitive radius, tactical cognitive radius. Like we were talking about many versus tactical many. Tactical many have page encryption that messes it up. Now we have cognitive radius, we have tactical cognitive radius. They're machines that sense their environment and respond intelligently. They seek other radius with which they want to communicate, right? But they avoid out with enemies. The interfering radius. So if somebody jams the frequency, you want to avoid, right? Very important for these cognitive radius to do that. They can form some etiquette defined by the FCC, the deliver service to the user. They can deal with an entirely new situation and learn from such experience. So hopefully they can learn how the jammer pops the frequency. Right? So we can learn that. We can provide service to the soldiers that's there. But tactical, ra tactical cognitive radius have a lot of challenges. We can go through them after this WMN and stuff. You guys know the WMN, right? It's another uh, DARPA initiative. They call it WMN or WMN? WMN? Okay. It's low-cost, multi-channel spectrum, agile, line mode capable wireless nodes built in with an expensive RF circuit. <laughs> this is really good history. Um, if you really go look at any cell phone manufacturer, the cell phone manufacturer hates cell phone defined rate. Because if I give you that phone and a year later I can, can just download another software and get the operated money, I'm not making money. But Apple want to sell you on your phone every two years, right? So, cell phone manufacturers like everything to be hardware based. You open that, you will find the top layer looks like your iPod exactly, right? Like all the apps and stuff. The bottom layer is the cell phone. It has the baseband, it has all the, the chip that does binary decoding or uh, not binary. Um, Turbo codes have all that stuff built in, but it's built with specific hardware, right? Um, because cell phone manufacturers like everything to be hardware based, they actually were able to bring hardware cost down. Right? How much you can buy a cell phone today? This is a lot of not free to sign it. But if you buy you can buy a, a low end cell phone for five dollars, right? Because everything in it is hardware based, and because we have 4 billion cell phones in our planet today, the cost can go down, right? So the idea of having low cost hardware that already exists to use it in tactical ratings were very, it was very, you know, attractive to Garfield. So actually, one of the initiatives of W man or women is use what's out there that's cheap so we can produce a cheap radio. So they actually the W man radio is a few hundred dollar radio and it's technically a tactical radio. And it can form a network with densely deployed low cost wireless nodes and active network players that mitigate the shortcoming of many individual nodes, blah blah blah. But you know what's the problem with W man and we go to field experimentations. Dynamic spectrum axis, this is a lot of great feature of the net. Contest based axis, based axis, user query the network to find information. It's not like the cloud concept built in it. It has a lot of great features, right? Why why is it used in the tactical world? It is and it's a mature radio because it doesn't have any encryption. And you know how much General Dynamics sells the AP chip? $2,000. They sell the AP in a chip. They sell it for $2,000 for a chip. So, I mean, they, the, uh, when you go to field experimentation, you can find that you name radio in field experimentation. But it's not deployed. It will never be deployed because it doesn't mean the encryption change. But the idea of having a low-cost radio 
Tactical radios are very expensive, just to tell you. The first implementation of that BMW waveform was in a hardware called GMR, Crown Mobile Radio. The radio cost half a million dollars. So the Army was going to buy a vehicle for thirty thousand dollars and put a half a million dollar radio on it. It didn't work. Uh, because in the tactical side, everything is very expensive to make its facts and the limited number. But for that man to succeed, to see it in the hands of soldiers in a war theater, you have to address NSA needs. And the NSA and DARPA, they don't like each other. I think you guys know all of that stuff. Well, it's hard to predict now the impact of, of cognitive radius. What will happen in the tactical world? So the Department of Defense tried SPR, Support Programmable Radio, with the Department of Defense Initiative, right? And the government spent a lot of money on Support Programmable Radio. But it took a lot of time and a lot of fiscal investment to have something come out of Software Programmable Radio. And up to today, Software Programmable Radio is not very practical. You take a software from one radio, download it to another, you can't. You have to do find bugs and you have to rechange some of the code because they have to check from some of the software differently. It's still not very strong, but it happens. If we take software and take it from one radio and put it in another and just do some tweaks with the code. So cognitive radio still needs significant research. We are not even at the point where we can actually model the decision cost. And this is very important for the Department of Defense. Um, you ask people in the Department of Defense that you know, know the tactical requirements very well. They tell you, you don't want me to put a radio out there that can morph itself, and I don't know how it will morph itself. What if it morphs itself and sends information to the enemy? So the concept of what the radio morphing itself and have that freedom is actually not very attractive to the Department of Defense field. That's why cognitive radius have so many rules when you bring into the tactical environment. The policies are very strict, the rules are very strict. And in the defense, they want that cognitive radius to be tested under all scenarios. The defense industry is spending on testing more than spending the vote, right? Because there is no room for error. So how, do, how are you going to test a cognitive radio under all scenarios? But the radio is meant to morph under any scenario. It is not an acceptable concept to the Department of Defense. So cognitive, cognitive radios, to become tactical, it will, it will have a lot of obstacles. I guess I'm done. I was supposed to take an hour, right? Okay. So the reference for that, it's a book coming in October. It will be day if you have not come this year. If you guys want to see what the book is about, I can go through it. Uh, and I can take questions. So how does Rifleman is an SRW radio. So the Rifleman radio is here. Yeah, the right from main radio is the uh, most successful GPS radio. It's out there already. So, the right from main radio is in this. So, this is the, it's an SRW, that carries the soldier radio waveform, but it carries a single channel. So, it, it forms a single submit, and you can put a two channel radio to get you out of it. But the other channels now that are used. You know, all these legacy waveforms, the EPLAR, SINGARS, and these, uh, one of them is UHF SATCOM waveform, and it became an S software program of the radio waveform in the JTRS program. So the right from main radio is deployed right there, and there's a two channel radio that takes it out UHF SATCOM now to connect it to outside of the SWS software. But the understanding is where that is in the WWW. So you have WWF oh. here, but why? Okay. In particular. All right. Technically, what happened? The WNW is 
test it, but never deploy it. The right from the radio is deployed. Okay. What's the future look like? It will look like this. Imagine these guys who go in Iraq and ride in this striker. So they are a squadron in the Iraq striker, and the soldier come out and be kicked over with the machine gun, you see the TV and all that. So these guys will be carrying quite some radio, right? Then the striker back there have a two channel radio one to the riflemen, to the soldiers, and the other one is the BMW channel. That was technically what would happen. So the striker has the ability to link the soldier softening to the WW softening. The officer turns cluster five, These are the old names. Yeah. Cluster five, I think, became uh, a sub W or, or HMS. So we'll check this as that we would form into this one. And cluster one became GMR, GMR by with a new name for GMR by. Because in the defense industry, when a program overruns, the budget has to be shut down. But you shut it down and you open it under another name. Now it's kosher for Congress. <coughs> Any other questions? How much, if any, of this technology can be used in areas other than military radio communications? It's a very good question. I love this when I wrote that book, I mixed history of science. So, um, I say most of the uh, commercial technology have to do with What's happening today? Let's take the initiative of the so called programmable way. Cell phone manufacturer rejected it. But base station manufacturer loves the so called programmable way. The concept applies. So what you see, the, all the good work that was done in software programmable radio, you will see it at the base stations that because I'm not selling you a new phone, so I am Verizon, I'm dealing with Africa. And these guys can upgrade my base station without me knocking it down and bringing a new one. It's an acceptable concept. So the software program the radio will show up. Cognitive radios are shown in the commercial world with, with defense research. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is some high quality standards now. You've got to have some spectrum sensing ability. Um, there is a new generation of the 82 waveform, the 82.22, I think, from IEEE standard spectrum sensing that came from dark waves. So it is common. What about law enforcement and emergency personnel? Yeah. You know what? You know the radio, um, law enforcement units there, the Tetra radio, if you've seen it? The Tetra radio, the law enforcement units have a very long history. Um, GDC4S in Scottsdale used to be called Motorola Government System. And as a matter of fact, the Vietnam War did it, what, 75, 76? Then there was the Yom Kippur War in Israel, 1973. And the Israeli raids were jammed. Israel had more area initiative than the U.S. for a jamming resistant raid. And the approach of control the government system. And they actually first Jamming resistant radio was deployed with the Tetra radio and was used by the Israeli forces. Motorola evolved with the Tetra radio to become commercial radio, and the Tetra radio is what you see with law enforcement. Today. So there is a lot of history. The thing is, the, the government pocket is deep, right? And the government pocket is deep that we can take risks. And the research area, but also the government have an interest that science be ahead of every other country here in the US. So they're always defunding and they're always encouraged that military technology be taken to the commercial world. We encourage that, but in the right time. Because, like what I was saying about the difference between Link 16 and Link 11, you have to downgrade to get it to the point. So we got, as long as you have the technological advancement, 
in its own growth to do commercialized technology and sell it out and make money out of it. So a lot of this stuff, yes, government based research makes it to do well. You know, in World War II, the problem of linking mobile radios to land lines was solved in World War II. And that would make cell phones a lot possible. You know, and in World War II solved it. We had it here after World War II. We had uh, car radios. Uh, but we were using very mediocre technology. As a matter of fact, science should evolve that way. The high risk problems are solved with government funding. Then when the problem is solved, it should be standardized. Because once it's standardized, it can be a bit quite commercial. Commercial doesn't like unstandardized. doesn't like that. Any other questions? Yeah, you could sell it, but how much will the Duffin Man raise it for? It will be for the price to raise such a few raises. So it's required. Yeah, but the price will be close to the S.O.T. But it's going to be more. Of course, we're going to set the chip to make it more. And now the Latin radio is in the sense of So does WWE the actual platform? Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I was visiting General Dynamics um, a new time, a year ago. And uh, they have something called the Mad Pack radio, in which it's a new channel radio that the signal guy in the squad room carrying his back. And one channel will be for the soldiers, and another channel for Lincoln with the vehicles or the fire. It weighs about 12 pounds. It's 12 pounds in the back of the guy for a while. The soldier is a 40 to 50 pound gear. Um, but the more showing and experimentation would be take the mass factory as a module for in the back and download the WWE waveform. for them. They were claiming that. And they were claiming it would be less than 100k versus the 500k dollar to get up for the to the of radio. Any other questions? Was it useful? <laughs> okay. Thank you.